Well that sounds to me like the old uh, kettle's boiling. Time for a cup of tea. We're fast up here in January the 3rd I think. Having a chat about what I was planning to do and uh, how I was going to do it. And I'm a very bad procrastinator. I do an awful lot of talking but not an awful lot of doing. So putting it out on YouTube or oh, Facebook I was going to do something meant I had to do it. So of course. So I'll just get this cup of tea and give you a little brief rundown of what's happened in the last three months. Well, as you can see folks, by what I got my hand, lambing has started. We're doing okay. We had um, quite a good run for a little while, but we ended up with one sheep lamb the other day with two lambs and no milk. So we managed to find a foster mother who had just one lamb, so she's taken off the little girl lamb and one is on a bottle. Which I don't like because it's never as effective. But we use stuff called lamb lac, which is really good. Expensive, but very good. And they usually do as well. But you've got to be quite methodical in how you, how you use it. I was still born the other day. And his front legs had come we were backwards and they did come out and we think they drowned because they weren't here. Of course you can't be here 24-7, it's impossible. And um, she's still got another arm and she's uh, taken a foster arm. We had a triplet as well, so we took one of the triplets and put it onto her. So it's not been too bad. We had one death beforehand and we had a few, a couple of prolapses. But not been so bad. The weather has been quite fair as well in the last uh, few days and the forecast next four or five days is quite pleasant too so we're looking forward to a, a, an easier run really and, um, you always wish you could be here all the time and you always think when something happens I should have been here and you never think about your successes you only ever think about the losses or the disasters but touch wood it's been no worse than any other year lambing quite well since uh, we've talked, we've bought a field it's called the Hog Field, which is there's a little bit of video about that as well somewhere. What we plan to do with it? The daps have come out into full force. Penny's still chewing sticks. Um, a few people have asked me what sort of uh, gear I use, and as I got all my information from the web, it's only fair to send that information back. It's a Panasonic G9 with a 12 by 60 lens. Polarizing filters always stuck on. I have it set at 30 frames per second and a shutter speed of 60th. And I leave it at that and I like it on Vivid because I like the colors. And um, I usually play around and leave the uh, ISO and auto. And um, then I have to adjust the aperture which can be a bit iffy in certain light conditions great camera great for stills great for video simple to use now on my chest here there's a little fluffy caterpillar that's called a road mic australian i've got a couple of them this is a radio mic so i can walk about and talk and i've also got one where um, yeah, put it on desk and it acts just like an ordinary microphone. Great things as well, you can actually go quite a long way away from the camera and still chat. Uh, what else? Oh yes, the other thing I've got, which I use, it's called the Steadicam. And it's this model here. Do I pronounce it? Zion or something. So, the camera is mounted in this cradle and um, balance it all up it's like uh, got a it's a gimbal basically and it keeps everything relatively sh sh um, level so you can walk and talk which I love to do 
So all most of my shots when I'm moving are done with this particular machine. You just have to walk slowly <coughs> rather than rush it. Which is usually what I do. And it needs a bit of setting up, balancing and so forth. But once it's done, cracking a bit of kit. So that's it. That's all I use really. Um, there's no other crew with me. There's no lighting. I and mean, I used to drag around a Canon camera and a zoning video camera to do what I did, which is two, two camera bags, two tripods. And I felt like a pack horse when I finished. At least this way, all I've got to do is just remember one or two things. Um, I mean, both the video, Sony video and the Canon camera are better cameras than this in their own right. But as a combination, no, it does the job well. So, firmly recommend it. So I went to the shop, I think I'll get myself a box of uh, jam tart, different flavours. I don't like strawberry very much, it's not my favourite. I like black corn and apricot, but I like strawberry. And guess what I've got? Six ones of strawberry. It's just the way it sums things up really, doesn't it? Anyway, what else can I tell you about? Mm, oh, I know. Um, Salt and Book One. This is Salt and Book One. Okay, uh, it's one of the three volumes I did. Number three is still about. Number two is only in the shops. There's none left, the wholesaler. But number one got sold out very early on. So I thought I'd ask a few people, did they fancy a copy on Facebook? And I thought, well, if I get 20 or 30 people, that'll be it. Anyway, we've got 200 people. So now I've got to go get a price from the uh, wholesaler or the publisher. Uh, this book here was 20 quid. It was produced six years ago. They've already warned me that the price is, everything has doubled in that time scale, so it's possible that it's not going to be viable. But I'll get the quotes together anyway and let you all know when I know what it's going to be. So it's a thread in there. I'm a bit of a, I am a procrastinator, I admit that. I'll put anything off doing something. I find talking into the camera sometimes a bit strange. Don't mind being behind it, but talking into it I find it a bit harsh. And this next few are going to be a bit difficult because we're lambing. This is why I'm doing this one up here. Um, we've got... The next plan would come up, come out will be uh, Cronk Do. Um, I also did another one of two of Glen May. I've got four all together. And the last one I did was the one walking along the right-hand cliff top from the Glen over towards the beach and then on to Peel. And that's a fabulous little footpath. I've never been on it. It really is one you want to do. In the next uh, few weeks, I'm also planning to get to Glen Russian. Do that one up there. That's a big one, that. And I really will enjoy doing that. And then we're going to go down to the point, or the port as it's called, in Balaf. Fancy that one as well. There's a whole pile on Celtic Will this summer, which I'm going to attempt to do. A few more glens, too, I've got to catch up on yet. And I'm probably going to do a bit more river walking when the river's not quite so harsh. Oh, and when Ass Falls, got to do that one. That fascinates me, that does. History, I've found a bit more on Facebook. I've been given some good in tips. So I think it'll make quite a good video, that one. Quite a good one. I've put in a bit of a joke video together, folks, so don't take it too hard when you see it. Okay, folks, I if you people ask me why these sheep of mine lose their wool. And I'll explain how it happens here, so you'll have some idea about this time of the year. Uh, they start itching along their backs and it generates a, a, I don't know, a process called aprolitis and uh, what that means is there's a gland in the top of their shoulder and they'll itch on the underneath them. and that just causes the wool to start to come off them. It's like an alopecia in humans and the, um, the itch along their back and this uh, hormone runs along the back and um, the wool starts falling off. The old shipper got it, but one of these breeds have got a strong enough dose to actually cause this to happen. And sometimes in a couple in the mornings, you'll find a complete fleece just lying in the field, like the sheep has just got up and walked away from it. Quite amazing, really. I was telling you about the sheep that lose their fleeces a little few day, uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, sometimes you come down in the morning and you'll find a complete fleece lying in the field. This is one of the lamb sheep. She just got up the other day and she's left it here. 
Well, it's good job the weather's kind to her. There's no such thing as Aprilitis. It's a complete fallacy. Um, so don't be taken in by it. As I said, it's just a bit of fun. Talking of YouTube, I set a goal really on uh, when I started out. If I got a thousand views and 50 subscribers, I would be really chuffed a bit. Well, as of today, when I left home, I had 216 subscribers, I think, and nearly 5,000 views and 360 hours of watching. It's phenomenal, really. And I really do have to thank you all because it's encouraging me to carry on. Um, to do it really. Um, I haven't had any harsh comments although I did a little one about lambing or the lambing shed a few days ago and that's created a bit of controversy about meat or non-meat eaters. I'm not really going to get into that argument at the end of the day each to their own. But I don't think you can have humans without animals no matter what you do. Animals will always figure in humans life somewhere. So to try and eradicate them from all you do, I think it's virtually impossible. But maybe you can. Maybe you can. Also in the field across, which you can't see because it's the angle of the camera, but it's over there. It's a four acre field. When we took it over, it big patches of these rushes everywhere. And they are a vermin, a scourge, because they take over a field. Nothing eats of them. Nothing likes it. And it's difficult to kill. A bit wet, but was fenced. And um, we usually try, if we can, over the few, save some money up and buy some land because land, they don't make any more of it. It's easily looked after and you can usually get rid of it. We rate it a lot this year. Bought some Oliver's seeds. And we've chosen Oliver's seeds because it's an agent of Alaman. And it's called, it's specific design for overseeding. At around about 10 kilos to the acre. Most unusual seed in so much that they're covered in nitrogen. So hopefully we'll get them a good start to germinate. Hopefully uh, we'll get a decent crop out of them this year. And uh, rolled them in with a uh, buggy. We're hoping to get some sort of uh, reseeding without ploughing really because obviously when you reseed you reduce all the carbon back into the air and I don't want to do that. We also planted a lot of trees down there and some fencing done by Kenny Coolen and the gang. I got a price from Kenny and I thought, I'll ask him if, uh, you know, if I can get the price down a bit. So I said to him, Kenny, if I help to, to do it, uh, what difference will that make the cost? And looked at me quite quizzically and very straight faced said, Ray, probably cost you more. Which I found harsh. But then when I mentioned this conversation to a lot of other people, everybody said the same thing. While I'm waiting for the kettle to boil, um, I know a lot of you are out and about these deaths at the moment because we're still on lockdown. For goodness sake, be very careful. This time of year there's an awful lot of sheep about lambing. These have only been born about, I don't know, 10 minutes. And they're already up on their feet. Trying to suck. And cattle. And uh, a sheep is fairly safe, but cattle can be quite uh, quite dangerous when you're uh, in a carving mode. So be very aware of them. And for goodness sake, shut the gates after you. And it says, keep out, please keep out. The other day I was out having a walk, and um, one of the neighbor's sheep I found lying on its back. Doesn't look very good, does it? One of mine's it's a neighbour's sheep. It just rolled down on its back here, which happens this time of year. So we just put the camera down and see if we can uh, put it back on the feet. She should be okay after a little rest. So if you're out walking, you see a sheep like that on its back. Roll it over, wait till she gets on her feet and steady, and let her go because they're very heavy and lambless down here. And if they get stuck, they can't always get back up. It's a horrible death for them. They blow up. And the fire keeps the midges away. 